Good afternoon. This is our ongoing series on how to uh, study the Bible. And uh, by this time, we're at about session eight, and we're about two thirds our way done. And so today, we're going to be focusing on the, the issue of the interpretation of Scripture. So the question is, what does it mean? Now, we have spent, been spending time on the issue of observation. The issue of interpretation is what we call hermeneutics, which is the science and art of understanding, translating, and explaining the meaning of Holy Scripture. I believe this is that the quality of our interpretation is directly related to the quality of our observation in the time we have spent really digging into Scripture. Interpreti interpretation is not the end in itself, nor is observation. So we spent all of our time just simply going through concordances and Bible uh, dictionaries, or we were doing uh, cross-references and stuff. Obviously, that leads us to the purpose of saying, well, what does this mean? But ultimately, the issue of what it means is, then how do I apply this truth in my life? Well, we'll talk about that in weeks to come on the issue of application. And application always demands uh, an honest approach to obedience to the Word of God. I believe that the primary task of the Bible teacher and preacher is to explain the Bible. Um, we realize this is the Bible at times is challenging to, uh, to understand. Why? Because we are reading the thoughts provided to us and the truths provided to us by an infinite God, and we are finite. Here's what it says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Bear this in mind, that the Lord's patient, patience means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with wisdom, the wisdom that God gave him. He writes in the same way in all his letters, speaking in them as these mat, of these matters. His later, letters contain some things that are hard to understand which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures, to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on the guard so that you may not be carried away by error of lawless men and fall from your secure position, but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So even the Apostle Peter knows that the proper interpretation of Scripture is important as in to study effectively so as to not to distort the message. And Peter, once again, also acknowledges that some Scripture is hard to understand, and it needs study and explanation. Well, I know there's some people that believe that's impossible then. Well, let's not. Don't give up. God is the one who helps us as endeavor. The Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. And so, uh, and explains and uh, enlightens the very life of Christ in the believer. And so let me encourage you that you're going to gain more as you study and you commit yourself to study. And here we have a book that's written 15 over a period of 1,500 years by many authors inspired by the Lord. But never forget that it is God's love letter to you. Now, we realize this, is that when we talk about the interpretation of Scripture, there's been some different ideas about that throughout the centuries. For some, it believed, well, this is only for the enlightened ones, or for those who have been educated, or those who are in spiritual authority. Well, when the Protestant Reformation uh, took place, one of the mainstays of the Protestant Reformation was this, was 
that scripture itself should be our sole authority and that the scriptures should be made available to the common man. And what a blessing it was that uh, the reformers took very seriously in the years after the Reformation to translate the scriptures into the tongue, into the language of the common man. Here's what uh, that great scholar and pastor R.C. Sproul says in his book called Knowing Scripture. Private interpretation is never meant that individuals have the right to distort the scriptures. With the right of private interpretation comes the sober responsibility of accurate interpretation. Private interpretation gives us license to interpret, but not to distort. Um, and so we get to these two terms, and the terms is that we come to exegete, or the word exegesis uh, of scripture. It is a compound Greek word that means to lead or to guide out of something, or you're looking to something and you're pulling from it. The opposite of that is a word called eisegesis, which means to lead into or to put something into. And so the error can come instead of us going to scripture and allowing scripture to reveal itself, we pull it out, is the danger of error is when we go to scripture with our own preconceived biases and we wanted to say what we wanted to say, and that's a danger. And so let me encourage you uh, in your life that your Bible would be, in a sense, it's God's love letter, it's your friend, it's God speaking to you. So I have found it helpful for myself to write in the margins of my Bible and underlying verses, and I'm using the cross-references. And so the Bible itself, and this study Bible that I own, which is a New American Standard Bible that I've had three different covers put on, uh, becomes my, my textbook, but also becomes my, my workbook. And it is a precious thing. Uh, one of the most precious things that uh, I have in my life. Uh, it's very important for us that we understand that there's a common myth, common and persistent myth about the Bible that is that its real meaning is hidden behind some surface messages. Uh, Wayne uh, McDill, a senior professor of preaching at Southeastern Seminary says this, even though the Bible uses symbolic and figurative language, most of it is clear to the reader, even when you don't know about the people, places, and events in question. You can graft the point of the text. I think this is extremely important. Let us never come with the idea, boy, that unless you know Hebrew, and you can have your quiet time in the Hebrew text, or you know Greek or Aramaic, that somehow you cannot benefit from Bible study. Now, those things may be extremely helpful, and they are. But ultimately this, the vast majority of Scripture, as we observe it and we interpret it, that, uh, that they're, they're so very clear. And uh, it would take really some gym, gymnastics to try to make them unclear. Um, Another part of that issue is that scripture has a singular meaning. So when you're going to a passage, it may have multiple applications, but it's going to have a singular meaning. Let me read this. Each passage of the Bible has a singular and specific meaning, which means it has a single and specific interpretation. This is an extremely important concept. A passage may have numerous applications or lessons we can learn from it, but it will have only one meaning and one interpretation. I think that, that that's uh, helpful for myself. That as I observe, I'm observing to get the clear interpretation of that passage. And then I can move ultimately on to multiple applications. Now, here's the question. Do we... Someone may ask you, do you interpret the Bible literally? Well, that's a kind of a loaded question, isn't it? And my own sense is this, is that I am supposed to uh, interpret the Bible 
accurately. And we'll talk about that's what the study of hermeneutics is all about. Here's an example uh, that I read that a three-year-old, her name is Amelia, is receives instruction from their parent to say, I would like you to go and dust the furniture. So the three-year-old gets the instruction from the parent, go dust the furniture. So she immediately goes, seeing her mother uh, sometime before getting some, uh, some sugar and dusting the top of a, of a cake. So she goes and gets powdered sugar and she is dusting the furniture with the sugar because she's taking it literally. Dust the furniture. And of course we know that that's a figure of speech. It means to not to dust it, but to actually to remove the dust from the furniture. And so part of it is this, is that obviously we are taking scripture uh, in its context. The, the little girl did not understand the communicative intent. What was the intent of the communication? And friends, that is one of the most important things of us getting from observation interpretation. What was God's intent? What is he intending to say? So obviously at times we have to, to look at the figures of speech. Uh, and so as we'll talk about, uh, uh, like here we go, you know, dusting the furniture. Or I would like you to make a sponge cake. Well, I mean, you could get kind of dangerous if you said, well, I'm going to make a sponge cake. I guess I should go get some sponges and chop them up and make a cake out of them. No, it's a, what was the intent? What is the... What are the meanings behind these words? And it is in that that we'll come with it to a proper interpretation. Um, all the factors go into interpreting a clause. And once again, last week we talked about it's best to see the fragment of, of communication in its proper form. So at times a sentence is simply part of a larger concept. And so let me encourage you to see the paragraph uh, as the context for whatever that verse may say. Once again, the verses, the verse numbers were added many, many centuries after the Bible was written. And they're very helpful. So we can quote chapter and verse, but let's make sure we're looking at it within the context. Now, once again, we want to look at look for the apparent communicative intention of God, the writer who was inspired, God breathed. And here's what uh, um, Lane Proven he is he wrote a book called Reformation of the and, and the Right Reading of Scripture. He's professor of biblical studies at Regents College. Here's what he says. Um, we are to read scripture in accordance with his apparent communicative intention as a collection, collection of texts from the past, whether in respect to a smaller or larger section of text. It means to do so taking full account of the nature of the language in which these intentions are embedded and revealed as a component of scripture unfolding its covenantal story doing just to such realities as literary conventions, idioms, metaphor, typology, and figurative language. To read it literally is, in other words, to try to understand what the scripture is saying to us in just the way in which we seek to understand what other people are saying to us, uh, taking into account as we do their age, culture, customs, language as well as verbal context in which individuals, words, and sentences are located. Now get this, this is what is meant by to read it literally in pursuit of the communicative intent of God in search of what we believe, how to live, and what to hope for. I think that's extremely important. Once again, we're getting to the bottom of what God is trying to say. So if I said to you, um, boy, uh, how many people are going to be here on Sunday? And I said, well, boy, I don't know. I can give you a ballpark figure. Well, there's no ballpark. Uh, it's just, it's a figure of speech for me. I'll give you, I can give you an estimate. So once again, we go to the intent and we're trying to see what is, how's God trying to, 
communicate to us. And often he's doing it in exciting ways by using figurative language. And these things are absolutely extremely helpful for us. Now, we want to look at five keys to interpretation. The first we must look at is content. That's the raw material, kind of the database of the words. Direct cause and effect between the content and its meaning. It's the questions of who, what, why, when, where, and wherefore. And we, we pick that up as we do our observation. So it's content. Next is its context. Uh, we don't want to take a verse out of its context. What, what was said immediately before and after this verse? So that's, once, that's it, the context of the verse. Um, here's an example. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul, after getting to the end of this great epistle of joy, says, let's stand firm in the Lord, beloved. And then he seems like he changes subject because then he urges Yodia and Syntyche to live in harmony with the Lord. And he encourages the brethren there to help them. Um, and then he goes into the theme again, uh, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice, let your forbearing spirit be made known to all men, the Lord is near. Well, if I look at the context of Yodi and Syntyche, it's not just random. I realize that in the context of what he's saying to the Philippian church, that they must be struggling with their joy, and they're struggling with their joy because of a lack of harmony. And he's using them as an example, and an example of how we should be helping people live in harmony. So, you know, we take it in the context given. So we want to look at, once again, in our observation, the literary content, what is the rest of that uh, paragraph about the historical context, what's happening at the moment, what else is taking place at the same time, the cultural mo moment in context, understanding the culture there is written to, uh, the geographical context, uh, which is extremely important, knowing and understanding the geography tends to have leads tremendously of relevance and realism of a particular account. So in my sermon this coming Sunday, Jesus is in Capernaum and he's walking along the sea and he comes back and he sees a tax gatherer's uh, office. Well, I think it's critical to know that Capernaum is placed on one of the great trade routes of the ancient world, the way of the sea. And it went right through Capernaum. And so it would be extremely helpful for me to understand, boy, what's a, a tax gatherer doing there? And why is it in that specific spot? Now there's also then the theological context. What did the author know about God? What's the, what's the context theologically that it is being written in? So an example could be the Book of Romans. We know that it is stated in the Book of Romans that it really is a treatise on the issue of what salvation is. And then he unloads the issue of what faith is and all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. And so we see this in the cultural and the theological context. So the first is the content, next is the context, next is the comparison. Uh, we compare scripture to other scriptures. Uh, Donald Gray Barnhouse, that great man of God, said, you very rarely have to go outside the Bible to explain anything in the Bible. So here's the, the greatest lesson I can tell you. If you want help understanding a passage of scripture, then be a student of the whole Bible not just that one passage. And yeah, it just takes a lifetime to be a student of the whole Bible, but that's great because we've got a lot of time and we waste our time on a lot of frivolous things, but it's never a waste of time to be a student of the Bible. Now, uh, the, once again, the best and greatest interpreter of scripture is scripture. And once again, I mean, tell you is that that's helpful for the Bible teacher or the pastor or the lay person who says, man, I want to really know the word. 
is let me encourage you to then know, read the whole Bible. And as you start, this really gonna help is it's gonna fill in the gaps as it relates to some of the word pictures and the phrases and the topics that keep coming up and again and again and again. So the next part, first the context, content, context, comparison, now the culture. Understand the culture in which the original text has its content, helps us to more fully understand. So in my sermon on Sunday, which is on Jesus calling Levi, who was a tax gatherer, well, then we see that he calls him, and then there's a party, all right? And all these people are there, and they're called publicans and sinners. Well, what's a publican? What's a sinner? What does that mean? Uh, and the issue of why would they have such a hatred for tax gatherers? I mean, we have tax gatherers here, and I don't, I don't hate uh, tax, it's inconvenient, but I don't hate them. So the issue is finding the cultural context helps that particular passage really come alive and helps us in, it, in its interpretation. And so understanding the original culture brings the text to life as well as adds accuracy to our interpretation. So there's where having a Bible dictionary uh, sources where you can understand, well, what is this all about? And uh, there, praise God, there's, we're, we have more resources, positive and great resources now than any other time in the history of the church. Uh, the next one would be uh, of the five keys to interpretation. The last one is consultation. Consultation. Using extra biblical tools and aids to interpret, to help us understand. I mentioned this last week. That could be something like a study Bible. Now, this is a study Bible. It has cross references in the back here. It's got a, uh, a dictionary. It's got all kinds of cool things. And so I encourage you to get a study Bible. Next, an issue of a concordance, which breaks down uh, literally every word in the Bible and you want to find, you want to do a word study on the word salvation, you can look up every time the word salvation shows up. Uh, part of those concordances also break those words down into the different Greek or Hebrew words that they come. So you may have multiple words for love. So I want to do a word study on love, but boy, I find here that it's agapo, agapeo or agape, and here is phileo, which is, means of uh, friendship, and you'll see the difference, and uh, that's a fascinating study to do, but a concordance is helpful. Next, a Bible dictionary. Uh, a great one is the New Bible Dictionary by Douglas. Uh, the Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words by Vines is a kind of a combination dictionary and concordance. Uh, Bible handbooks, Erdman's Bible handbook is a good one. Uh, Nave's uh, Topical Bible is a good one. There's atlases, uh, Moody, Bible Atlas of the Goodman, Zondervan makes a good one. But no matter what, I mean, even today, as I was studying for my sermon, I wanted to look once again at where the trade routes went. Uh, there was the two great trade routes. There was the King's Highway and the Way of the Sea. The King's Highway went on the Transjordan up on the Jordanian hills, up uh, to the east of, of Israel. The way of the sea comes down into, uh, by the Sea of Galilee, and then crosses over into the plains uh, out by where today Tel Aviv would be. And so ultimately, I wanted to look again at, at a Bible atlas to show, and then there's like, connecting ones where this uh, smaller trail went to connect the king's highway to this and it's, it's fascinating and it helps as i'm trying to get a picture in my mind so that i can proclaim the word more vividly and more accurately okay and the next one would be would be commentaries now there are many commentaries and uh and so you can fill your whole library, but now most of those commentaries you can find online for free. Now, let me give you a recommendation. I think a time will come 
once again, where having a physical books as resources will come be very important. In the last couple of years here in California, we've had power outages and it was kind of nice to have my books. And there, once again, after I've done the observation and then after I've done the study, then I can go and see what, gee, I wonder what John Piper, or I wonder what Spurgeon says, or I wonder what MacArthur in his commentary say. And I think that's an important thing. Now, also too, I have commentaries that don't, they're all orthodox and biblical, but they may not come from the same background that I come from. That is a helpful thing. That is helpful because it helps me to see things through another person's eyes. And so that's something that's helpful. But once again, we use the Bible as our primary source. Be very, very careful about constantly quoting some person. Well, Pastor Gary said this, or Pastor John said this. And so be very careful because uh, let Scripture be the authority. Okay, now we want an issue of understanding figurative language. We'll talk more about that next week. But one of the keys of getting scripture properly is the fact of having a clear sense of what kind of figurative language is using. So there's a hyperbole, that's a, uh, an exaggeration. So take the log out of your own eye before you can take the speck out of somebody else's eyes. That's, that's hyperbole. Metaphor is a comparison in one thing that expresses another. A paradox is a statement that sounds absurd or self-contradictory, but it is a logical thought. A simile uses like and as. Uh, there are rhetorical questions. There is our, our idioms that, that are very uh, geographically centered. And so the issue is, if I would say, hey, give me a ballpark figure, that would be something that would be, you know, that someone in New Zealand would understand is they got ballparks there and they're in the English language. Um, but a person living in the Amazon would, you know, I said, give me a ballpark figure, they would be, they would be dumbstruck. And so I would have to figure out that idiom. And they may speak to me in idioms that I don't particularly understand. And so that's one of the, challenges of communication or even Bible translation. Now, I'm gonna pass on the issue, we'll do it next week, of 10 principles of, of how to keep out of trouble with figurative language. We'll do that next week. Uh, but once again, when we compare scripture with scripture, it helps us put, keep scripture in perspective. So many of these idioms or word pictures are used many times throughout scripture and they'll help. Now, I wanna close by talking, these are five reasons there are so many interpretations of the Bible, okay? Well, the first is this, is because people are lost. And if you try to go to the Bible and you're not spiritually aware, and it says this, that unbelievers cannot interpret the Bible correctly because they are spiritually dead. Ephesians 2.1, Colossians 3.13, they're spiritually blind, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, and the things of God are spiritually spiritually discerned, 1 Corinthians 2.14. Okay, so we all realize this, that if someone goes to Scripture, that it is extremely difficult to say, wow, that's, you know, I'm going to be a proper interpreter of it. Now, I do believe in this. I do believe that God provides common grace. That may be controversial to some, but I have met people who were pagans. They were they were living terrible lives, and they're in a they're in a hotel room, and there's a Gideon Bible. They open it up, and they're reading, you know, the wages of sin is death. But well, I mean, they. It was the Holy Spirit of God and his graciousness that opened their eyes at that moment. And so that we know that's possible. Well, and not only possible, but we know that that's the power of the word. But ultimately this is that uh, one of the reasons why they're misinterpretations is people don't come to scriptures with spiritual eyes. They don't come 
uh, as they come at times as as spiritually blind and it doesn't make sense to them. Uh, the next reason why scriptures are often interpreted poorly, or there's so many interpretations, I think is laziness. Second Timothy chapter two, verse 15. If Paul commanded Pastor Timothy, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. The word diligent there in the New American Standard Bible is the Greek word that means give maximum effort to something. Go after it. Don't be lazy about it. In fact, I believe this is that, uh, you know, we often can pick the low hanging fruit, but sometimes the best fruit's way up in the tree. It takes a little bit more effort. And here it says, be diligent to pursue it. So many Christians handling God's word while attempting to come to a theological conclusion, friends, we have to give it our best effort. That means a time of wrestling with the text, reading, observing, asking the right questions. And I believe God will bless our diligence. We consider the historical setting, all the contextual things. It takes a lot of time. And so part of it is many people come to a poor interpretation or not a full interpretation because uh, they're simply lazy. All right. Now, I, I have to say, I, I'm sure, I'm, I know I've been lazy at times and how God has rewarded me when I am diligent. Um, the next, so the first is a lostness of why there's many interpretations. People are lost and they're blind. Next, they're lazy. Next, is there a bias? Everyone faces a battle of bringing their own personal biases to the text of Scripture. To one degree or another, most of us have been guilty of this. We come with our preconceived notions. Well, maybe this is what I was taught. And so let me give you an example. If, in fact, I was taught as a brand new believer that, um, that that because of the reformation of Israel as a nation, that and the promise that that generation would not go, would not pass away until the return of the Lord, there were those who had the interpretation that, well, Jesus then is going to come back within 40 years of that time. Well, uh, that meant for a poor interpretation led to really poor application. All right. So there was. Always people setting dates. Well, he's going to come back in 19, you know, 88 or 86 or whatever. And they kept changing the numbers. Or the fact is the only way to look at the, um, the Bible is that there's going to be the rapture of the church and then seven years of tribulation, the church will be gone. And realizing this is that as I wrestle with the pa many passages dealing with the return of Christ, that I have to make sure that I leave my biases uh, aside because I want to get it right. And I still wrestle with these things. And so uh, there you go. Uh, it is too easy to interpret the Bible based upon our favorite systematic theology or ecclesiastical traditions. Make sure you realize, even if you have something as grand as uh, the, the great creeds of, of the scriptures, that those creeds are based on scripture, that the, the creeds are drawn out of scripture. We don't get the creeds and, you know, and impose them on scripture. So basically this is that I, a goal of sound exegesis is to take, only take out of the text what the original authors intended. We, be him, we, we have eisegesis when we allow our own personal biases to influence the biblical interpretation. So be very careful about your biases. This is what I wanted to say. Um, the next reason there's so much misinterpretation at times is a lack of humility. A lack of humility. A lack of allowing the Word of God to have authority over your life. Uh, over something you may even have a preconceived notion about. And so part of it is, as we look at it, 
we realize this, is that we must come to the scriptures humbly. Uh, when we come to a doctrinal position completely disassociated from the Bible, it's nothing but pure rebellion. Say, no, I'm going to impose this. You know, and not only does it limit your ability to apply it properly, but I believe, unfortunately, there are churches, whole groups of Christians, that are really off base because they are majoring on a minor. And so that's what happens when we lack humility. You know, we have to come to it. Lord, speak to me. Speak to me even if it's contrary to what uh, I was taught. Now, I, you know, for myself, I grew up in a church that, um, I'm, that my great-grandfather -grand, great was, was a circuit writer. And so part of it is, is that that's a long change in the theological position of that same church then and in the one I, ones I grew up in. So part of it is this, is that, that even, even with churches that at times the theological stances can change, can, can flutter, and we need to make sure that we're going to the Lord humbly and without bias. In the last, we must have a firm hermeneutical style, and we must base our study and interpretation on, on proper steps. So the rules and principles one uses to come to a biblical interpretation play an indelible significant impact on their understanding of Scripture. And so, once again, we'll talk about that next week. We're going to talk about what are the principles of hermeneutics. And I'm convinced the most honest and sure way to arrive an accurate interpretation of the Bible is to know what the literal grammatical historical hermeneutic is. Let me break that down. Literal. That means we mean to, we understand the Bible in its normal plain meaning and shy away from over-spiritualizing the text when it should be taken as written and literally. Okay? Next, grammatical. That means that we need to pay attention to the rules of grammar and nuance in the Hebrew and Greek languages. The words matter. The words matter. So it's literal. It's speaking literally to us. And to me, is it typically the simplest answer is, is the right answer. Next, it is grammatical. And last, it is historical. We mean we must understand the background and context of the passage. Once again, it is who it was written to. What did it mean? What was it supposed to mean to the original hearers? And then we go from there. I'll give you one example of coming to different doctrinal conclusions without doing proper hermeneutics. And, and, and it's in the modes of baptism. So a person could say, well, I believe in uh, pedio baptism or child baptism and you ask them why they say well because it's biblical and they'll say here's some examples of it and there would be those who believe in called credo baptism which is believers baptism and they would say well we baptize only those who believe in the gospel and have repented in it because it's biblical now each one arrived at a completely different interpretation and I would say this, I would challenge those people, go back to your premises. Are you willing to say, boy, I'm going to go back and say, I'm going to, I'm going to look at my biases. Am I being lazy? Am I lacking humility? And I believe that if you come to the Lord, honestly, and with humility, and you have determined, I'm not going to be lazy, I'm going to go after it. The Lord will give you and his Holy Spirit will bless you with a proper interpretation. God bless you. Come back uh, next week and we will be, uh, we'll be studying together on the principles of hermeneutics that you can use throughout your life and your ministry. God bless you and have a great evening.